I loved cooking from a very young age. My mom is, was a very good cook, and we cooked together as a family. That was how we sort of enjoyed our time together. And uh, when I was 14 years old, I got a job uh, making donuts in a donut shop very early in the morning. And be, I'd ride my bicycle there and then work and then go to school afterwards. And then I worked in a pizza place, and then I met a professional chef, and he changed my life because I saw him cook dinner. He was a friend of my older sister's, and I immediately said, I want to go to chef school. I want to be just like you. And so I went to chef school very young, when I was 17. I graduated from high school early so that I could start my you know, my journey as a chef. And so that was, you know, nearly 48 years ago. So when I was uh, going to chef school on the south side of Chicago, I got a job working at the Conrad Hilton Hotel, which is a huge hotel right downtown. And I worked in the catering department for about a year. And then I was ready to work with the French. I thought I wanted to really get involved in very fine cuisine. So I was hired at uh, Maxime's of Paris, who had a restaurant in Chicago at the time. And I worked there for a year. It was great training, very, very French brigade system and, and extremely, um, you know, I would say I learned quite a bit uh, it wasn't that enjoyable <laughs> being the only woman in, well, in my class at chef school, I was one of two women in a class of 100. So it was really, we were very unusual. And the same in the kitchens where I worked at the hotel, at Maxime's. But there was one restaurant called Le Perroquet that I wanted to work in more than anything because I, I experienced the food. My boyfriend had splurged and taken us there for dinner and I was extremely excited. So I, I got an interview for a job there and the owner was Yugoslavian, old school, old European and uh, he said, you know, I can't hire you. You're far too pretty. It'll cause chaos in the kitchen. So would you like to work as the hat check girl and take people's coats when they arrive? And I was like, wait a minute, I've just spent two years working hard and two years in chef school. So I started writing him letters, calling him on the phone every week. After about six weeks, he said, okay, you can come to work tomorrow morning, $3 an hour, and you can peel shallots and garlic in the back. But of course, what he didn't probably bargain for was that I was pretty serious and I, I immediately showed the kitchen th that I could do almost anything. And I was, uh, you know, promoted very quickly. I was running the kitchen when the chef went on his vacation about nine months later. So it definitely uh, made a big impression on that particular team. <laughs> so my business partner, Susan Feniger and I, opened our first restaurant in 1981, and it was very much based on the experiences that we had had uh, apprenticing in France and working in restaurants in Chicago, and it was very rustic kind of French food. But we soon got excited about other ethnic cuisines. She took a trip to India, and she came back, and we put Indian food on the menu, and then I took a trip to Thailand, and we put Thai food on the menu, and then we both took a trip to Mexico, and when we came back, we were madly in love with Mexican food. So we were getting ready to open a second restaurant, a larger restaurant with a much better kitchen. And we turned the small restaurant, City Cafe, into uh, all Mexican. It was called Border Grill, opened in 1985. And soon after that, we started writing cookbooks. We wrote City Cuisine about our first uh, kind of restaurant's cuisine, which was global, all over, like a city has its little 
you know, pockets of ethnic food and Thai town and, you know, little Japan. So then we wrote a book about the Mexican food called Mesa Mexicana. And soon after that book was published, we were on a tour to promote the book. And we were in New York and the Food Network had just, just started showing uh, food television, really. It was the first, other than Julia Child and you know some of the older cooking shows, they were programming 24 hours a day food programming. And they immediately asked us if we would do a show for them. So um, we were, you know, we've been business partners for a long time and we're, we're still business partners 42 years later, but we do tend to, and, you know, finish each other's sentences and poke fun at each other. And we love to collaborate. So we have a lot of respect for each other. And we love the whole process of um, the creative process. It's, it's really better for us when, you know, there's both of our ideas come in. It, it makes it exponentially a better finished product. So we did 294 shows called Cooking with Two Hot Tamales on the Food Network. And then we both did uh, Top Chef Masters and we've been on lots of other TV shows. And, and we also had a radio show called Good Food that was ran for about five years where we every, every week had a, one hour to talk about the, the new things that were coming into the market and how to cook with them and, and what was interesting going on in the food scene. Chef's Manifesto is a group, a global group, really intentional about helping chefs understand how their decisions affect our climate and our, the sustainability of the planet. So I was introduced early on in, in London and I really was very, very happy to have, a, for me, Chef's Manifesto means that this is the exact action plan that chefs can follow if they want to be part of the solution. And they're based on the sustainable Deve development goals that the United Nations, 135 countries agreed that we should benchmark and measure our progress towards 2030 and 2035 and 2050 when we need to make changes. So since the food system is such a big driver of biodiversity loss or you know, carbon emissions. There's so many ways that chefs can make a difference. And I think rather than feel hopeless and helpless, <laughs> I loved running into Chef's Manifesto and having it be, you know, a guiding light and a, a real toolkit for me. Well, our restaurants are not super expensive. So if I ran restaurants with a very high check average where every customer was paying $100 for their experience, that would be pretty easy to practice very sustainable practices, I think. For me, the, the customers come in and they spend between $30 and $40 per person, including cocktails. So I've always wanted my restaurant to be very accessible but I've also been really a champion for sustainable practices. And what I do is I just work towards that by finding ingredients that I can afford, but that are healthy for the planet and grown with respect to the earth. And you know, it's, it's a little more work, but it actually helps to bring in customers and it helps me to retain employees who really appreciate that philosophy. Sustainability for me means that whatever I'm consuming, it can be reproduced over and over and over again so that my grandchildren can taste the same products. If it's unsustainable, that means there's a limited amount of resources on the planet to create that, if it's caviar or foie gras or wheat or corn. And it's also, with monoculture crops, if one fails, which it, one wills eventually, then we could have a global crisis of hunger 
because we're so dependent on only a few kinds of grains, rice, corn, wheat, they're the major ones. So I think becoming more, uh, you know, varied in our diets is really important to the, the health of the human race and the planet. I hope that people are inspired by my course to uh, look at their purchases and their actions and the way they put food together on the plate just a little bit differently with an eye towards plant forward, proteins that are raised with respect to the earth, biodiversity, and really the, the impact that all of our decisions make every day on the climate.